Welcome. I think we have uh, no commissioners on the phone uh, that are visible. If anybody's on the phone and we're not seeing you, please speak now. Um, welcome to the meeting of the Maryland Healthcare Commission. Agenda item number one, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the March 21, 2019 public meeting of the commission. Uh, second. I also have a motion to approve the April 18 minutes of the office. Uh, we have two here. Yeah, is there a second? Is there a motion for the April 18 minutes? Second. All in favor. Very good. We'll move on to agenda item number two. Commissioners have received the written updates from our centers. Commissioners, do you have any questions on the written updates? Commissioner Brady. Yeah, I wanted to ask if there was some clarification. I was seeing that in Kenneth's portfolio that there was a problem with a contractor being what looked like significantly slower than last year in terms of being able to bring the data, clean it up, get it ready for us. And I just wondered if there was a little bit more information on exactly kind of where that stands and what the likelihood of, of getting that resolved is. It looked like you, I felt for you, Kenneth, when I saw, read that, that part of the report. It, it looked like kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah, that's the, that's the statistician's term for it, right. So um, what we did, we sent out a, a notice of kill to the uh, contractor and um, to, uh, basically to outline all of the problems and we requested from them a, uh, a written um, a written uh, a written uh, root cause analysis and also a, um, a written um, corrective action plan so they're supposed to provide that by June 10th and then we'll work from there Say that in this area, especially with uh, among the people who do this kind of work, um, and the federal government being somewhat shakier about what the, I mean, there's there's a number of organizations who can do this kind of work. Who normally the vast majority of their portfolio of work is federal government. But um, I would think that if you needed to find a replacement, uh, there's plenty of people who would love to have a chance to start to work for the state and to work for this commission in particular. Oh, so I I believe so, so as well. Yeah, I I would well. encourage. I don't. I just don't think you have to take this sort of bad performance it, right. it, unless unless you feel there's really good justification. I guess the other thing I would encourage you is if is there any reason that if it can't be done by in-house staff, this can't be subcontracted so that we're not left hand holding the bag in terms of if they're whatever, losing staff, pulled away on other contracts, et cetera, et cetera. We, um, we, we, we have been with FFS a long time and we know, uh, we know them pretty well, but um, one of the problems uh, that they were having is that um, they had to lose um, um, a number of very experienced staff in, in, in the last six to twelve months, and the problem is that they have replaced them with with um, not people with the same level of expertise. Right. So as a result, um, you have lots of heads, yes, but not the experience to really get the job done right. in a timely manner. Right. So um, so we will uh, we will correct this if even we have to go out. Um, a year early on the um, on the hours. Okay. Or the other thing, just you know, having worked for organizations like that, even if you've left or retired or whatever, they can they can bring you back on contract to finish up what what I would think is an important contract like this to not leave us hanging. Right. Yeah. And we have to consider also the disruption. Oh. You know, um, as far as uh, the, um, the um, submission of uh, of claims to the MCDB. You know, well, certainly good luck with this, and you know you have my full support, certainly. Absolutely, in any absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, I just haven't heard anything about the Department of Labor and ERISA. I, I'm thinking it's, I mean, there really hasn't been any action. Has there been anything going on? There have not been any action with the Department of Labor um, since um, I, we had sent in comments, you know, um, I was asking this about the uh, with the APCD council, but there have not been any any um, any movement on that. However, there has been some 
some some talk about uh, um, data leakage with um, some senators as far as um, um, there has been some reason again as far as if a national APC is concerned and we're talking about um, leakage and and the uh, self-insured ERISA um, um, conversation started to percolate once more. But but those are preliminary discussions, and um, and they have not um, set a date as to anything uh, concrete to really actually discuss. Other questions? Does the executive director any of the center direct? Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Boyle. Uh, hi, I just want to know, under the Maryland Primary Care uh, Program Advisory Council, uh, we had a discussion about the importance of adding a nurse, and also there was a question about the consumer or patient representative. Have either of those been resolved? So we are going to bring forward a uh, recommendation for the nurse practitioner today. Uh, we have uh, had uh, repeated attempts to reach out to a AARP without uh, without a lot of success. Um, we're going to give them one more opportunity. Uh, but if you have a recommendation, uh, we'd be happy to uh, add it to a potential representative. We are very much uh, interested in in a Medicare beneficiary who is uh, in a practice that's participating in the program. That's the uh, that's the caveat, but given that the program uh, includes over 200,000 Medicare beneficiaries, certainly we can find one uh, that's knowledgeable and interested, and we can do this, but relying on AARP has produced, uh, proved unproductive up to this point. Other questions from commissioners? Does the executive director or any of the center directors have additional updates? So, uh, first off, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want have a few items I want to cover. First off, uh, I want to uh, be sure you see the uh, 2018 annual report. Uh, this is a report that the centers each contribute to. Uh, Bridget Zumbro uh, took it under her direction, uh, and this year, uh, Unlike previous years, in which we did it in-house, we decided to bring in a outside contractor to help us with some of the graphics work. Uh, so she had the uh, uh, unenviable job of coordinating with the centers as well as the uh, contractor and getting uh, this report in place. Um, we'll be uh, if you have uh, questions or reactions, uh, please uh, pass them on to me. Uh, we intend to follow this pathway. Uh, going forward uh, with some uh, probably tweaks in how we do it um, with a focus on trying to make the annual report uh, shorter, uh, more um, more riveting, and um, uh, attention gathering to the, uh, to the uh, legislature, who is the primary audience for this. Um, it went, has gone from primarily text to a mix of text and graphics. Uh, and we'll continue to improve on that. Uh, I'd also note in the update that um, sprinkled throughout the update in the past has been some notes about um, our web uh, presence. Uh, we consolidated them and tried to put all of our website um, statistics together. Um, it, it compresses the report a little bit, but allows you to uh, see uh, visits to our overall website and then both of our quality reporting uh, frameworks uh, next to each other to see where interest is, in the, is highest. If you have thoughts on that or questions, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. We won't have a legislative update today, but uh, I did want to be sure that everyone knew that uh, the remaining uh, bills that the commission had um, had uh, been uh, had rated as high priority. They were largely bills that had come out of the uh, Maryland Healthcare Commission CON Task Force, uh, which uh, Commissioner Sargent had co-chaired uh, and later chaired, uh, had all been signed by the governor this past Monday. Uh, they included the, uh, the uh, bill introduced by uh, Chairman Pendergraft that uh, increased the capital threshold uh, for hospitals as well as required requiring the Healthcare Commission uh, to 
uh, annually uh, review um, uh, the state health plan chapters for potential uh, revisions. Uh, it also included a, uh, a bill introduced uh, sponsored by Delegate uh, Kipke in the House and Senator Kaufmeyer in the Senate that modified CON for, um, for ambulatory uh, surgery. Uh, we are already getting uh, interest in that. It allows uh, entities uh, of all types to establish up to two OR AM search centers uh, without uh, CON. Uh, currently, that's limited, uh, limited to one. We also um, uh, had Senate Bill 649 uh, signed. That was the emergency bill, which actually had already taken effect. That allowed um, allowed facilities, uh, in, inpatient drug facility, drug treatment facilities, uh, offering ASM uh, 3.7 uh, care to expand the bed capacity without without uh, a CON review. Uh, it also allows um, hospices to both establish and expand inpatient bed uh, bed uh, facilities uh, without CON. Uh, in that area, we've already seen uh, action. Uh, Carroll Hospice has added uh, six, uh, six uh, inpatient beds uh, on, at its inpatient hospice on the, on the campus of Carroll Hospital Center. Uh, and we've seen uh, Recovery Centers of America uh, add uh, significant numbers of beds at its Earlville campus as well as the Maryland, uh, Maryland House had uh, inpatient drug treatment beds um, at its facility. So this um, emergency bill uh, already has impacted and benefited uh, uh, providers. And uh, you know, our thinking is, of course, that uh, providing uh, additional drug treatment beds uh, is going to be a benefit uh, to the residents of the state as we continue to uh, wrestle with the uh, significant opioid uh, epidemic, and the additional inpatient hospice beds uh, uh, aligns pretty well with the total cost of care effort. Uh, we also have, uh, we saw the Maryland Trauma Fund bill uh, was, was signed, uh, and that would allow for uh, us to develop a methodology for, um, for paying standby costs at the um, at uh, Park, uh, sometimes I know in the shark, shark trauma. Uh, up to this point, uh, Park was the only uh, trauma center that was not uh, eligible for standby. Uh, this statute uh, changes that. Um, we also expect, um, as part of our annual reporting on trauma, to come to you with some recommendations on additional funding needs potentially for the trauma system in the state. Um, that's not specifically required in this bill but it's part of our annual reporting uh, obligation. Uh, previously, uh, the governor had signed uh, Senate Bill 1018, which required uh, the Health Care Commission, uh, along with the Office of Health Care Quality, to look at uh, potential uh, reductions in services in at uh, Chester County and to identify causes for that. We have uh, are developing an RFP, and we think we'll both uh, conduct that assessment as well as uh, engage a engage a, uh, a consultant in potentially uh, developing some uh, innovative um, ideas for uh, how inpatient services could be continued, not only at uh, Chester Town but other rural hospitals in the state. Uh, moving on to a, a brief discussion on the quality uh, area of our responsibilities. Uh, first mm -hmm. off, we've been informed that Robert Inhoff who is the CEO of the Maryland Patient Safety Center. Uh, the safety center is something that we designate, uh, has, has resigned. I've had a conversation uh, with, the, uh, with the, one of the board members and said that we would uh, like to have some input on, on uh, who uh, they might, uh, qualifications of a uh, candidate. Uh, they promised to um, share that with us. Uh, I reminded them that uh, since um, Paul Fronstein, a former commissioner, had left the board that we would be um, interested in having a commissioner serve on the Patient Safety Center. 
Um, and I think they are open to that idea. If anyone um, is interested, please uh, share the uh, indicate so with uh, with Chairman uh, Pollack. Uh, and we will also be um, moving forward with the des redesignation of a patient safety center. Uh, we've never designated anyone other than uh, the Maryland Patient Safety Center, Inc. Uh, sort of a convenient uh, uh, grabbing of that name, but the, they are the only one that's ever expressed interest in that. But we will redesignate uh, a patient safety center in uh, in January of 2020. Uh, so I think it's imperative that they um, make these hiring decisions um, before we have to make a determination on our new designation. Uh, another area of interest, uh, Teresa's team has worked closely with the LeapFrog group over the last several years. Uh, certainly one of uh, uh, former Chairman Moffitt's uh, uh, achievements was the establishment of collaboration with LeapFrog. They recently uh, released their spring of 2019 uh, report, which uh, continues to uh, to show some uh, improvement in Maryland. Overall, uh, LeapFrog nationally reports that uh, about a third of hospitals uh, received a grade of A for patient safety, uh, and about 40% 40, 40 of hospitals nationally have a grade, however, of C or below. Among the states that um, all 50 states report now, uh, Maryland uh, continues to be uh, in the bottom half, but we are moving up. Uh, last fall, we were 38th, we are now 30th. Uh, clearly, uh, progress uh, is being made, but more is needed. Among the 40 hospitals that report in, uh, in Maryland, uh, 29 had the same grade they uh, earned last fall. Um, however, there was uh, 10 hospitals now have, um, have uh, a grade up from eight in, in the fall, uh, and nine hospitals improved uh, by one layer grade from the previous uh, reporting last fall, uh, and only one, uh, one declined. Uh, we had no hospitals that earned an F uh, score, uh, similar to uh, the results from last, last fall. That's good news, uh, but clearly uh, more work is going to be needed, uh, certainly. Uh, a ranking of 30th on the patient safety measures among states uh, shows this room for improvement. Uh, just by way of a very brief uh, sort of pr perspective on this, there are 28 measures that are in the patient safety rating. Uh, 15 of those uh, pertain to uh, uh, outcome measures, and I believe 13 pertain to process measures. Uh, and the data is basically from uh, the periods of 2016 to the uh, middle of 2018. So it's relatively current, but may not, uh, as some hospitals argue, capture the most recent uh, improvements that are going on uh, due to these new models in Maryland. Uh, but that, ch that improvement should be reflected uh, in, in uh, the fall report or in following years. So uh, we can continue to see improvement there. Uh, lastly, um, we have talked about establishing our uh, work group to revise the, uh, the uh, inpatient site uh, chapter of the state health plan. That work is underway. It's uh, opportune that we're doing this. There's a host of other work groups that are focusing on uh, behavioral health. Uh, Megan and I are participating in a, in a work group convened by uh, Delegate Peter Melnick that's looking at um, information needs to facilitate uh, greater access to uh, behavioral health services. Uh, what um, we will be uh, sharing our progress with that group, as well as the uh, progress with the work group that's uh, looking at changes to the state health plan in the coming months. So uh, clearly, uh, although we have uh, high quality behavioral health providers, there are significant challenges here. Uh, particularly with uh, children and adolescents, uh, and it's not um, uncommon to hear reports of, of uh, adolescents languishing in emergency departments for three, five, 
seven days or more before a placement can be found uh, here in the state. So certainly something that the, uh, the state as a whole, as well as providers uh, and the public should be concerned about. We have to answer any questions. I have a couple. Uh, one in terms of, I, and I mostly like to encourage, and, and correct me if I've got this wrong, but the last time, with, or the first round in the hospital, ratings came out and they were so poor. And we asked uh, the organization, you mentioned before, the patient safety or commission. Okay. We asked them in. Um, and uh, I personally, I was quite unsatisfied with their responses. Uh, and, it, and it at least left a suspicion of, of what we call an economic industry capture. Um, and so I am not an expert in patient safety, but uh, when you made that kind offer for a commissioner to become involved, I would like to encourage any of my colleagues who um, have any expertise in that area, because if we're putting our endorsement on an organization that has performed, in my opinion anyway, poorly in the past, um, and the ratings are part of the result of that kind of whatever, chicken and hen house, or you know, fox in the hen house, or whatever you want to think of it as. Um, I would just greatly encourage my colleagues to take an active interest in that. I think you're absolutely right, Dan, on that one. Uh, the other one is just a technical question. Uh, we talk about the trauma fund every month. Um, given uh, the ACA and whatnot, who is actually in the trauma fund? Is this immigrants who are not eligible for health insurance? Or is it someone else? Because the trauma fund is for the uninsured, isn't it? The trauma fund has really uh, four funding flows. Uh, one is the uncompensated care patients, those that don't have insurance. We've never dug uh, that deeply uh, into it. It's our post ACA. It's our understanding that uh, hospitals are very aggressive about. Uh, enrolling anyone sure. who qualifies in Medicaid. Uh, they have less opportunity uh, for patients that are above Medicaid but uh, should have insurance but don't. And our suspicion is that's a significant uh, share of those that remain. Uh, but it's very likely there are un, uh, undocumented people, uh, folks without documentation uh, that are here working or uh, injured in the course of their life that uh, qualify for uncompensated care that have no other source of insurance. And um, certainly a share of those are probably funded. Um, so it's, it's, it's the ACA, who slips through the ACA net? Or, on or whatever, or either on purpose or, you know, for their own decision to, wait, to, to not get coverage and they're not okay. being penalized now. So then the next uh, flow is for uh, we do pay uh, the differential between Medicaid rates uh, for um, patients that are uh, tra uh, trauma patients, but um, and we make up the difference. This is typically 20% um, the gap. Between Medicaid and Medicare. Medicare. Okay. And we are currently um, uh, looking at uh, elevating that uh, rate to uh, what we pay for uncompensated care, which is 105% uh, of Medicare. To increasing that um, that reimbursement level, uh, the third area is for uh, on-call stipends to uh, largely uh, level two and level three trauma centers. That's the area where we've seen uh, very significant growth in uh, payments over the last three to four years, as uh, community hospitals have looked uh, to these funds to offset commitments they've made to. Um, Keep trauma physicians uh, available to provide trauma care. Whether there's anyone to bill to or that not. they otherwise okay. are, got it. And then the last uh, funding vehicle is uh, standby, which is not actually funded through the fund itself, but direct HSCRC to establish uh, rates to cover some of the uh, recognized standby costs. So standby is paid to a hospital who is reimbursing a hospital to be on the hospital grounds to provide uh, quick, quick uh, access. Is that like helicopter? Or? No, it's, I mean, it would be analogous to you. I'm in, I'm affiliated with the hospital or uh, under contract, uh, and I remain at the hospital to deliver uh, 
trauma care, but there's obviously flat time, okay. and that's permitted. Um, actually, Medicare permits that to be recognized as a Part A cost. Uh, and so uh, back in 2003, 2004, when this was established, it dawned on us that why pay standby out of trauma fund dollars, which are taken from uh, automobile licensure uh, fees, we could use Part A dollars rolled into the rate setting system to fund standby. And then periodically, uh, lastly, it's actually a fifth flow, uh, we do give level twos and threes uh, small amounts of money uh, to fund what they uh, uh, define and our auditors confirm is bona fide uh, trauma equipment that typically uh, involves uh, uh, a grant to each of the seven trauma hospitals, uh, uh, a small amount for replacement trauma equipment that allows us to uh, use some of the excess uh, funds. Uh, what we found is that the most dramatic increase is on call, uh, and we will be uh, either directed by the legislature uh, chairs uh, in, our, in our, oversight, our oversight committees or do it on our own responsibility to bring to you some recommendations on perhaps other changes in the fund, uh, including uh, some adjustments in the way that trauma, these trauma subsidies are paid, or even potentially um, and the at, at the prodding of the trauma uh, groups, uh, some thought about potentially raising uh, the assessment um, that now residents would pay for trauma. It's been uh, from the very outset five dollars uh, of an annual renewal and. Uh, Certainly, the governor's not likely to be enthusiastic about that, but again, it's been since 2003 that this funding took place. Thank you. And just a quick question those facilities that don't need a CON to expand beds, I assume they get the rates adjusted automatically? HSCRC, or how does that work? Yeah. So, uh, these changes apply, apply to non-hospital uh, non uh, organizations. We did change the uh, what's called the capital threshold, uh, and uh, hospitals will be able to uh, expand uh, their services, uh, non-categorically regulated services. That is. Uh, they would still have to come to us for a CON for open heart surgery, but simply expanding um, up to uh, the lesser of $50 million or 25% uh, of their global budgeted revenue for the previous year. What about behavior beds that are part of the hospital? So, uh, Emergent Ad set System has a lot of flexibility. I think what Chairman um, O'Connor is talking about is there's some discussion about moving some uh, some, some uh, behavioral health beds uh, on in the shore system around potentially to to uh, to Chestertown, uh, and that's something we're aware of, and we'll be talking with the shore leadership uh, on that. But theoretically, that could be through an exemption of CON. I just want to do a proverbial foot stop. Um, to the comments about um, mental health care for children and adolescents. I know to say that a, a kid is in the hospital for two, three days, more often I hear stories of people, about children being in the hospital in the emergency room and, and, and it's happened 30 days waiting for a bed to open up. Worse than that, families having to send their children out of state as the only option available for care to make sure that the child lives another week. We have to do something about this, and it has to be more than just um, inpatient care. We need to start looking at the, the community continuum of care. This is a chronic disease. It's not just an episodic issue. So, put some thank you. Um, I believe Kevin McDonald will introduce a new employee.
welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I presented on the results of the nursing home family experience of care uh, survey last month, and there were a couple of questions that I'd like to follow up for you. So first, the question was about the nursing home caps, and you asked if we could compare our data to the nursing home caps. The nursing home caps is not um, required, so there's no publicly available data to compare it to. So unfortunately, right now we can't compare it. The other question was about whether or not our survey results can be compared to the CMS star rating. And uh, what I found was that all seven of the domains in the survey, as well as the overall recommendation, which was the question, would you recommend this nursing home? All seven of those categories, or all eight of those categories, were statistically significantly and positively correlated with the overall star, the um, health inspection star, and the staffing star. None of those categories were associated with the quality star, um, but this pattern is consistent with other results that have been found in the current literature. Mr. Sargent, can you? Break down what it means to be associated with these categories and not associated with the other ones. I'm sorry, I'm, I have legal training, so numbers are sometimes a little bit harder than I should be. <laughs> uh, the, do you, what were the domains that were yeah, what is it? What does it mean that they're associated with that category? It means that they um, are strongly associated at a statistical, this is statistically significant le level. And so as uh, so our domains are activities, security, food, staffing, care, autonomy, and the physical aspects of the nursing home, and then would you recommend this nursing home? And so all of those were strongly associated with the overall star. So as our domains went higher, um, the scores on our domains went higher, the scores on the overall star went higher. Which gives us some comfort that we're measuring the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Please, I mean, Fleck will announce the departure. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Um, do any of the other do any of those center directors have any additional updates? No. Excellent. Uh, I, I have one additional update. Uh, I have. Uh, App and Commissioner Sargent has graciously agreed to serve as the vice chair uh, going forward for the Maryland Health Care Commission. So, <laughs> the, uh, uh, before we consider action items today, I want to remind commissioners that if they should wish to recuse themselves on any action item, they should move to the MHCC conference room. Staff will let you know as soon as the commission has completed action on that agenda item, or you can just watch it on the television, which is in the conference room, which I have learned very well over the years. The, uh, uh, at the end of agenda item number two, agenda item number three, uh, certificate of need, Peninsula Regional Medical Center, introduction of inpatient child and adolescent psychiatric hospital services. Peninsula Regional Medical Center in Salisbury is a general hospital that currently provides acute inpatient psychiatric services for adults. The hospital proposes to introduce acute inpatient psychiatric services for children and adolescents. The proposed project will involve renovation of existing space to create a 15-bed psychiatric unit, which will be used by both children and adolescents. Eric Baker, Program Manager and CON Analyst, will present the staff recommendations. Good afternoon, Chairman Pollock and Commissioners. 
Central Regional Medical Center in Salisbury. It's the largest general hospital on Maryland's Eastern Shore. The hospital currently provides acute psychiatric hospital services for adults. Peninsula proposes the introduction of acute psychiatric hospital services for two new age groups, children and adolescents, and proposes to renovate an existing space at the hospital for this new patient population, creating a 15-bed psychiatric unit that will serve both age groups. The estimated cost of this project is $8.5 million, derived from cash reserves and philanthropy. Currently, there are no hospital programs for children and adolescents on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. The Eastern Shore does have three general hospitals with psychiatric programs, including Peninsula, but all three only serve adult patients. Historically, a small special psychiatric hospital serving children and adolescent patients, operated by Adventist Healthcare in Cambridge, but this hospital closed in 2015. Eastern Shore has a state psychiatric hospital in Cambridge, but it also only serves adults and is largely filled with patients that would be classified as forensic. To hospitalize the child or adolescent with a psychiatric disorder, the nearest alternative to the lower Eastern Shore region served by Peninsula is a hospital in Dover, Delaware, approximately 60 miles north of Salisbury. The Maryland alternative our hospitals in Baltimore and Washington, D.C. area over 100 miles from Salisbury with drive times of approximately two and a half hours and longer times with eastern shore traffic congestion. To assess the demand for hospitalization it could experience, Peninsula examines child and adolescent discharges from the lower shore or region it serves. This includes areas of southern Delaware and the eastern shore of Virginia. It also reviewed the number of children and adolescents with psychiatric disorder seen in its emergency department that were ultimately transferred to other hospitals for psychiatric care. Based on this assessment, Peninsula projected a need for a combined child and adolescent unit of 12 to 15 beds for a projected patient fund for a child and adolescent unit of 8.4 patients. The staff's assessment was that a unit at the lower end of the range with 10 to 12 beds would probably be adequate and sufficient to provide bed availability for a high proportion of the time, giving existing trends in the use of hospitals by these younger age groups. The upper range of 15 beds projected by Peninsula is based on having a bed available 99% of days using a statistical model for the expected fluctuation in demand. This implies the need to operate an average annual occupancy rate of approximately 56%. Staff does not believe that requiring Peninsula to scale back the proposed number of beds would significantly reduce the cost of this project or significantly reduce operating costs because staffing the unit will be scaled to the patient census achieved. Staff concludes that the need for this project has been demonstrated based on the poor geographic access for child and adolescent psychiatric hospital services currently experienced by the population in the Lower Eastern Shore. Peninsula is the only logical place at which to fill this gap. Peninsula has the resources to implement this project and has community support. It reports that $2 million has already been raised in philanthropic support for the project. The hospital projects an ability to generate income from the new psychiatric program at a level of demand anticipated. HSCRC staff review of the project indicates that reasonable rates that support the cost of the new program are achievable. The project will shift patients to Peninsula primarily from Dover Behavioral Health and hospitals in Washington, D.C. and the Baltimore area. At an institutional level, these shifts will be relatively small. The impact on the distant alternative hospitals is not significant to warrant denial of this project, but the consequent continuation of poor access to the proposed hospital services for the lower eastern shore. In summary, the project complies with the applicable standards of the state health plan and has been demonstrated to be needed. Peninsula is the only provider services in this area of the lower shore is a cost-effective choice for providing access to these services and has the ability to establish a unit for the new patient population with a relatively modest renovation project. The project should be viable and its impact will be on balance positive. Based on its review and analysis of the application, Commission staff recommends approval of this application. At this time, I'd like to represent or Introduce Christopher Hall, the Vice President and Chief Business Officer from Peninsula Regional Health System, and let him introduce members of his team who are here. Thank 
Thank you. Um, do I have a, a motion to approve a certificate of need application by Finish Levy? We have a we have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Commissioner Perkins. Looking at this application, it, it looks to me like the standards are so old that we basically threw out our regulatory need standards and substituted with a different statute. And I'm not at all quibbling with the results because it seems like there is some, at least some need and there are no services. So it's just kind of a no brainer. But it, I just wanted to emphasize the point that you're making that we need to revise these standards. Right? We, we shouldn't have standards that are so old that we can't apply our own regulations to them when. So uh, the work group to revise that chapter of the state health plan we started, uh, started meeting next last month, and we hope to have some proposed rights by uh, the end of the summer. Uh, if we don't have, if we haven't adopted a new uh, chapter, uh, we are to report to uh, HGO and Senate Finance on the status of the uh, this chapter. So I think there's. Uh, Significant uh, impetus for us to complete this uh, and get, get it through. Commissioner Marcus. Just another, another administrative thing. Again, not necessarily in opposition to this um, application, but um, community support is a vital part of this application process. It shows that people within the community are aware of it and support it. Um, obviously, <laughs> Wearing what was not there is any community associations in support of it. Um, the city of Salisbury or the or like Honolulu County. Um, the, they were from the uh, health department. Um, the health department, um, and you know, that's that's about it. So if in the future, working forward, if we could press upon people to reiterate the importance of it. And why it's there in the first place. It's not there to be just an administrative um, pain in the butt for people. It, it's there so that we make sure that everybody within the community is aware of what's happening and concurs with it. Or if there's any concern within the community, they then get an opportunity to have a heads up that this is coming. It's an important part, and I, I, I've stressed this before in other ones that we've done, but I, I think we need to focus on this a little bit more. It's the opportunity to communicate with the community what's happening within our medical facility. Thank you. Commissioner O'Connor. What range of severity of psychiatric illness does this facility handle? I mean, criminal psychiatric behavior or? I would think mental health. I mean, what's the range of illness that they'll be able to handle? Come up to the table, please. Speaking of the microphone. We don't accept criminal. Um, Catherine Smith, Executive Director of PRMC. We take both voluntary and involuntary adult patients. What range of psychiatric disease? Is this equivalent to behavior? Yeah, everything from affective disorders like anxiety and depression all the way up to schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Is it a lockdown? We have a lockdown unit? It is a fully locked unit, yes. Yeah. We have options. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Gray. Just a kind of a process question. As you pointed out, and certainly just if memory serves me, there's quite a lot of integration that goes on with this hospital in terms of southern Delaware. And you talked about the Dover facility, and you probably pick up some, some patients actually from Dover. In, is there, when we're doing a certificate of need, is there any sort of outreach or coordination with the state of Delaware in terms of what go, and I would assume we have in other parts of the state, when we get in the western counties, we're talking about West Virginia, southern Pennsylvania, things like that. Do we reach out to them at all, let them know? I'm, I'm guessing no, but, uh, and, and that's all right to say, but, but this is, it's, and, and, and correct me if I have the wrong hospital or nothing, but it strikes me you guys are very integrated with that sort of, of uh, that southern Delaware. I would assume a fair amount of your patient population comes from that area as well. 
Um, and is there any sort of, you know, going over this with our counterparts in the state of Delaware or any other state? So uh, the relationship with Delaware uh, is not nearly as formalized as the relationship with the District of Columbia, where there's uh, significant patient uh, uh, cross border crossing. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that we um, do uh, specifically as part of the review process. Um, it may be that um, the institution uh, has some uh, discussions uh, in the course of submitting their CON application, but um, there's nothing that we directly uh, do in terms of interaction with the. Well, it sounds, yeah, it sounds institution to your institution because you're making estimates that you'll be actually pulling patients from Dover to this unit. So I assume that wasn't an assumption on your part. I assume that was some communications with Dover. No? Well, and I also think it's partly based on where their ED patients are currently coming from. Right. Okay. So at this point, other than the district, you may not be. I don't know if, if Paul is here to comment more generally, but we have some data sharing, uh, historic data sharing arrangements with the District of Columbia. I think periodically we, we uh, done had some similar sharing with uh, the uh, Pennsylvania and West Virginia. I'm not aware of anything formally with Delaware, but maybe Paul can comment more fully. We don't have any sort of formalized procedure in our project review process for getting together with other CON uh, programs in bordering states to talk about uh, projects like this one, where you know, there is a well-founded assumption uh, by Peninsula Regional that they will retain uh, the patients or most of the patients at least who historically have transferred to jo Dover from Peninsula Regional uh, because they need admission to a psychiatric facility. Um, we do communicate with those programs uh, on an as-needed basis, and that's fairly common to exchange information, get updates on inventories of facilities and services when when we're reviewing a project that you know really needs that sort of background intelligence. Um, but but we don't we don't put on an alert that you know we have a project here that that may affect some of your facilities. Um, what I find generally is that uh, hospitals, you know, they they're looking around at their environment on a pretty regular basis, so most of them are kind of aware of what's going on um, in the surrounding area, even when that's a cross-state area, uh, and they, they, they know that projects are underway. Uh, our website, I think, you know, is probably pretty regularly visited by uh, hospitals in other states that, that are close to our border, and so they have the ability to see what, what applications have come in. and, uh, and they can certainly communicate with us if they have concerns about those, and that, that has happened in the past. Yeah, and that's all I was, I, I mean, the notion that we would, it would be an awkward situation if we found that we had approved the CON for Peninsula at the same time our counterparts in Delaware had approved the CON to, to expand Dover, and all of a sudden now we have excess capacity because clearly patients can cross those borders easily. So, okay, thank you. Uh, hearing no other questions, uh, we have a motion on the table and a second. All, all in favor? Opposed? Hearing none, congratulations. You have your seal in. Thank you. All right. Agenda item number four. Uh, I will officially recuse myself in this matter and hand the gavel over to the uh, vice chair. As I step into the side room. And punishment. Okay. So agenda item number four. Is the University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore City. The, the general hospital that currently provides acute inpatient psychiatric services to children and adults. The hospital proposes to introduce acute inpatient psychiatric services to adolescents. The proposed, the proposed project will involve the renovation of the existing space to create a 16 bed psychiatric unit, which will be used by both children and adolescents. Kevin McDonald, Chief of Certificate of Need, will present the staff recommendation on this request. Kevin. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner Sargent, and, and good afternoon, Commissioners. So this project by the University of Maryland Medical Center would relocate its current uh, inpatient child psychiatric program within the, within the hospital to newer space, to modernize the space, um, and at the same time would add eight beds for adolescents. Um, the cost of the project is below the capital threshold, so the reason that uh, it's requiring a CON is the addition of the new service to the adolescent, expanding the services to uh, adolescents. The project will be funded with cash. Uh, University of Maryland Medical Center will not be seeking a change in their GBR to cover the cost of the project. To give you some background and perspective on um, this service line, the use rate per 100,000 uh, child and adolescents for inpatient care, inpatient psychiatric care in Maryland has increased over the last decade, but most of that uh, increase, did I say decrease? Yeah, I meant to say increase. If I, it's increased um, by about 2%, but most of the increase is within the adolescent cohort, which has increased by 26%. At the same time, uh, child usage has gone down slightly. Uh, the primary driver of this project is the numbers of patients, number of adolescents that are being seen in the medical center's uh, pediatric emergency department. That number is averaging about 750 a year over the last couple of years um, and averaging about 130 transfers to other inpatient psychiatric units. The average weight uh, to get a placement is 33 hours and usually involves uh, a security person having to be available uh, with that um, person who's, who's waiting. The service area uh, is Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel, and Howard Counties. Uh, that is where currently most of the child patients are coming from, and the assumption is that that will be the same draw area for the adolescents. In addition to the 130 transfers a year, um, other likely streams of patients would be, there's about 20 patients a year, 20 adolescents a year uh, with psychiatric diagnosis that are um, put in the on the general hospital floor for lack of a bed anywhere else. Uh, so they would be one group of patients. Another would be the outpatient clinics that are referring about 40 patients a year. And then the affiliates of University of uh, Maryland Medical Center, uh, St. Joe's in, in Towson and BWMC, um, they're projecting that about 25% of the 200 transfers they collectively do would um, come be now sent to the University of Maryland Medical Center. The total projection is about 270 patients a year, inpatients a year. Average length of stay under just under nine days uh, would project at an 85% target occupancy to 7.6 beds. And you know the application here is for is for eight. At the same time, the child admissions are projected to increase somewhat, um, and um, their bed capacity is, is also eight. Now, there is the ability to shift between, if, if there's fewer children, but more adolescents, there's the ability to switch in between. The staff is, one of the advantages here is the ability to share staff between um, those two age cohorts. Uh, cash is available for the project. Uh, the project is viable without a, a GBR adjustment, and there were numerous letters of support, including from the former uh, Commissioner of Health for Baltimore City, uh, Leanna Wen, uh, Chief of Staff of the Baltimore City Public Schools, Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health, and the past and present uh, mayors of Baltimore. The impact on other providers is uh, primarily going to be uh, Psychiatric Institute of Washington, where right now about 
a hundred of those uh, transfers are going. Uh, and Shepherd Pratt uh, Health System. Uh, between the two of them, the impact is about 75%. So I overstated slightly uh, the, the uh, impact on uh, watch, Institute of Watch, Psychiatric Institute of Washington. In summary, based on uh, staff's review and analysis of the application, we recommend that the commission find that the proposed project uh, to add inpatient adolescent psychiatric services at the University of Maryland Medical Center complies with the applicable state health plan standards, is needed, is a cost-effective approach to meeting the needs of the community, is viable, and will have a positive impact on the healthcare delivery system without adversely affecting other providers of healthcare, uh, the healthcare services. Accordingly, we're recommending that uh, the commission approve the application. And with us uh, today is um, a number of individuals representing the, app the applicant, including uh, Ella Aiken, who is uh, their attorney from uh, Gallagher, Villas, and Jones. And Ella will introduce uh, the rest of the um, contingent. From the medical center whose support was an integral part of this project and who are here today to continue that support. We have Dana Farrakhan, the senior vice president of strategy, community and business development from the medical center. We have Donna Jacobs, senior vice president of government and external affairs for the University of Maryland Medical System. We have Joseph Hoffman, senior vice president and chief financial officer for the University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Sarah Edwards, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Medical Center, uh, Greg Raymond, Vice President of Nursing and Patient Care Services, Clinical Practice and Professional Development, Neuroscience and Behavioral Health at the University of Maryland Medical Center, and with Scott Timothy Hall, Director of Strategic Planning at the University of Maryland Medical Center, Leonard Taylor, uh, Senior Vice President for Asset Planning at the University of Maryland Medical System, and Brent Alam, uh, project manager at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Okay, so why don't we put a motion on the table first and then we can ask the questions later. Second. Second. All right, does anyone have any questions or discussion? Commissioner? Uh, thanks. Um, I don't doubt the need for this, but I'm just curious. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, a short discussion on why the adolescent um, need is, uh, for these services is growing so. I mean, it seems to be across the board that's happening, and I'd love to hear some of the root causes. Thank you, that's a great question and comment. And unfortunately, throughout the United States, we're struggling with this issue. The rates of mental health and illness in our youth and adolescents is just increasing. Um, suicide rates, despite much effort and prevention, are increasing as well. There's many different theories around that, um, from the use of social media, the stress of school, and just our different family structures. And so it's um, very important, as you've mentioned throughout today's proceedings, um, how we need to have lots of different interventions within the community and at all levels of care. And are some of those interventions part of your plan? I mean, we're trying to, I mean, I understand this is complex, but uh, how do we get to the, the root causes and how, as a society, do we start to address them? Absolutely. So that is very much a part of our plan. Um, at the University of Maryland, we have many prevention programs. I'm really embracing the idea of population health. We have to start soon and early. So we have integrated programs within family medicine. We hope to expand to pediatrics. So we're working early on as soon as women identify that they're pregnant so that we can help to establish a healthy attachment, which will prevent, hopefully, the use of these acute care services. I, I just guess um, further on that, is this something that the commission, I mean, we're approving these, you know, increased services which are needed, but 
is this something that we can start talking to the governor and the, uh, the Department of Health on how to, at least in the state of Maryland, better address some of these, these issues? So I, I think uh, you've highlighted an issue that um, is being talked about at multiple levels. Um, I did mention uh, the legislature is, is um, uh, trying to address this. The uh, sec health secretary and the deputy secretary are looking at uh, a category of patients which you know, they label as hard to place adults and adolescents that are especially uh, difficult where um, individuals are, re are uh, presenting with uh, behavioral health uh, uh, and other uh, other conditions that make them um, not suitable for uh, what's available. So um, yes, I think the point that uh, Commissioner Tamarcio raised uh, is really important that um, community-based services are oftentimes uh, inadequate or not, uh, not deployed as quickly as they might. And we have a lot of work to do in developing a community-based services, I think, in addition to um, inpatient services. Uh, the governor is very um, you know, focused on what the mix is and how that would be funded. Um, the staff are participating in a couple work groups. Uh, I mentioned one, uh, our own revision of the state health plan uh, is another, but that's going to focus only on inpatient services. I think what is available uh, on the outpatient side is uh, even more important. Uh, Less, um, less oversight on the part of the state is uh, typical in that ar arena, and clearly I think we have to pay uh, more attention uh, to this configuration of community-based services, be they through FQHCs, through primary care practices, through uh, standalone uh, behavioral health centers. Uh, they're all going to be needed, but um, stay tuned on that. I think there's a role the commission can play. But we certainly can't play this you know, by ourselves. It's going to require a heavy involvement of the entire Department of Health, uh, particularly the Behavioral Health Administration. I just wanted to jump on that and say that um, just as care in hospitals is changing um, for other medical issues, this has to change a lot. We just have to change the way that we approach it. And again, this is this is a um, a chronic disease. It's a chronic issue. It's not something that's a one episode thing. And I think you know having um, medical centers expand their care um, on cases that you can take care of makes it so that other centers, Shepherd Platt or other places like that, can then focus on those more difficult to place people um, because there's just not enough beds to go around at this time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, I'm uh, curious, why aren't you asking for more beds? Um, I think space is an issue. <laughs> is that the reason? Well, as through. Is it space? Does somebody else want to define for a minute? Because obviously you're going to be full uh, first day. I mean, if your projections oh. are correct. So. Definitely, there's always going to be a need, but I also think. Um, limiting, trying to get to the root of this. So we need acute care beds, but we want to be shifting resources to ambulatory outpatient programs. You know, acute crisis stabilization here is five to seven days is the average length of stay across the, the state. And that's limited what you can do. So, oh, you don't so need well more beds. It's not a trick question. I'm not trying to start it, but, but the whole issue of, you know, it takes so much to get here they ask for what eight beds or what, whatever it is, and and the question is, you know, if you're going to grow, yes, we we know we need them in the community, we know need them everywhere, but I think every hospital is forced with the issue of of needing uh, these kind of services, and I'm just curious. We appreciate the question, and and um, Dr. Edwards has read in part we have uh, the space constraints that we work within, but at the same time. As the application details, we did do a need analysis based on the patients that we expect to draw in that came to uh, demonstrate a need for eight beds for the service. I would point out, however, that 
under the regulations once we have the, a CON to add the service, if we find that there is greater need, uh, we are able to expand the number of beds without coming back for a new CON um, as long as we're within the capital threshold. Uh, and we don't you know, require to spend more than $50 million to do that. So we do have flexibility within our licensed bed capacity to add more beds should there be a greater need than is projected. Commissioner O'Connor, and then I had questions. Just one comment along the lines of what Commissioner Tamarki has said. Uh, I believe, and you mentioned it, I, social media, I think, is the culprit for the rise in adolescent uh, behaviors. And I think it'd be a great place, uh, a great platform to force, like Facebook and these other media, to address more healthy behaviors among adolescents. I don't know where to tell you how to start that, but that, I can't figure out a better platform than that because I think that's probably the root cause now, root cause of a lot of these issues. Um, and I had a question that really isn't necessarily for what we're proving today, but in this area where we have child beds and adolescent beds and adult beds, is it possible to build a facility that is sort of medically able to meet the different needs and flex, like use one bed for one purpose? But change it over when you need more adolescent beds and you don't need as many child beds that day. In other words, are these have to be completely separate facilities medically, or are you able to, to accommodate greater needs in one area than another as they change over time? So, the child and adolescent beds, we do have the ability to flex between. My understanding is the adult, we, we would not flex the adult beds because they're, those are separately. Uh, separate facilities, separate, um, there are separations between those populations. Uh, but we do have the ability to flex between, uh, we will have the ability to flex between adult, I'm sorry, between adolescent and child beds. Yes. Uh, this is probably more for Kevin than, um, than you guys. Um, certainly we've seen now, this is two in a row that we've seen, and there's an obvious discussion of need. So do we have a feel for, I guess, I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for the assessment of the overall park. If we've made these, so we've, we've made a move in terms of the Eastern Shore and a move now in terms of Baltimore, you said Baltimore City, County, Howard, and Anne Arundel. It sounds like the DC counties are fine if you're sending people to Washington sites, those guys. So do we have, are we, are we done? Uh, and or are we now have a little bit of a patchwork, or will be good in Baltimore, good in D.C., good on the Eastern Shore, but you know Waldorf, La Plata are in trouble, or uh, you know Westminster, or however we want, you know the the Western County. Do we know sort of what? Do we have a state level needs assessment, and do we know how far through that we progress? I think the study that um, is now underway and the work group that will be um, following, uh, following upon that would probably be the place that that question will be answered. I, to my knowledge, we, we don't have that currently. Okay. So we don't know whether we're halfway done, three quarters, et cetera. In terms of investment. In investment, and I don't want to be overly hung up on geography. I mean, clearly you've been able to move people from Baltimore down to D.C. without massive disruption or whatever, but probably it's better to be within five miles of home than 50 miles of home. So I guess I'm just trying to get a feel for, we're, right now we're, you know, this feels a little patchwork to me, rather than a systematic, is there some, now we're not the ones who are gonna say, Hospital X, we want you to start offering kids site beds. I mean, that's not really our job, uh, but we certainly can identify where there's a need uh, and just know the assessment of, of how much of this problem we've been able to address. Yeah, so, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, we, we reviewed uh, a white paper that looked at psychiatric hospital services. And, you know, our takeaway from that was that um, for adults, uh, we do have a pretty good distribution of programs, general hospitals, uh, a small number of special hospitals, private special hospitals, state psychiatric hospitals are really now a different patient population from what those other two sectors serve. Um, and it's hard to, to look at utilization of bed capacity across the state uh, for adults and, and really understand why we have such a problem 
transferring patients from a hospital ED, for example, that doesn't have a psychiatric unit, and trying to find uh, an appropriate transfer. Anecdotally, that seems to be an issue, uh, even more so for adolescents and for children. And in those areas, we don't have the same distribution. Uh, there are smaller, smaller demands. Um, so to some extent, we think of those as probably more specialized types of patient populations to serve. Not every general hospital that has a psych unit uh, probably should have adolescent and child programming because the patient census they would serve would be too small to make a lot of sense. Um, for the adolescents, what we've seen is an increase, as Kevin referenced, in the use rates for adolescents. So that's clearly a patient population that we're concerned about in terms of increasing levels of demand, potentially. Uh, demand has already increased and making sure we have some resources. So, you know, these two applications we reviewed today uh, are, are, are very good in, in, in our view in terms of helping to address that problem. Uh, child psychiatry, it's, it's, we don't see increases in demand there really, in the, in the population use rate. It's, it's not going up or down, it's kind of just bumping along. Um, and you don't see growth in that population that's driving increases in demand in the future. So our guess would be we're not going to see, you know, uh, a lot of development in that area and the demand doesn't seem to warrant it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's always going to be such a small sector that you're only going to have a few facilities in the state would probably make sense to have that. And, and that means we're not gonna have great geographic access uh, for the entire state. Uh, but clearly the, the issue area, the problem area that we're concerned about right now is adolescence. And so uh, that kind of gives you a feel. Mm -hmm. and, and with this work group, uh, we're hoping to then translate those kind of broader uh, takeaways from our white paper into a set of a state health plan criteria and standards that, you know, to the best of our ability, kind of reflect what the thinking of the commission should be mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, improving the distribution of hospital resources in the state and addressing the areas that we need to do. But there's, as we, as we talked about during that session a couple of months ago, we're, <laughs> we're really kind of groping for an answer to, you know, just how do we move patients from emergency settings who need hospitals into hospitals quicker. Uh, and then and obviously part of that is the entire continuum. How do we get people you know, into outpatient programming? How do we get more resources into outpatient programming so that, uh, that we're, we're doing a better job of getting uh, people into the right place at the right time uh, based on their needs? And it, it's, it's hard to look at the system now and, and right. believe that that's working that we have either a delivery system or a financing structure that's really working to achieve it. Yeah. Well, one just thought, so, you know, I, maybe not practical, but we spent a lot of time developing our all payers database. There certainly is an analysis here where you can compare adults to adolescents to children in terms of zip code of where they live and zip code of who's, who's filing claims for them, just to see is it a, you know, a 50 mile average for kids and a, and a 20 mile average for adults those sorts of things to give us an idea of where we may be going, you know, taking into account that in the western part of the state, distances across the board are going to be longer than they would otherwise. But that would at least give us a feel for, you know, if you run into trouble in Waldorf or whatever, are, are you constantly in a situation where if your kid's going to get care, it's, it's a 50 mile distance? Just to give us an idea of how to, a little more, I, I mean, I just hate Adolescent, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence is not really evidence in my mind. It, it highlights to, to, to display the nature of the problem. But there, I would just, if there's some chance to have evidence that actually shows us, it won't show us so much demand, but it will show us kind of hurdles to care, access to care barriers, if we really are talking about significant distances in order to seek care. So, just a thought. Thank you. I guess the only question I have is on, on the financial side of things for a minute. Um, you're just reading this information. I mean, total cost per day is 2,871 is the rate per day for these patients um, based on what I'm reading here. That's a lot of money. Um, so we talked a lot about looking at other resources, moving outpatient, looking at the uh, development of better outpatient programs within the community to, to service these patients. Um, so from a cost standpoint, 
as we continue to add these beds uh, into the system, um, you know, we're going to be faced with having to deal with some of these cost issues. So I think it's really important that we focus on other ways to address the psychiatric needs of both adolescents and adults at, at a lower cost setting. I don't think you talk too much, but in this area, just as a general policy area, uh, what Paul was referring to, I assume, was that you know state psych hospitals are now pretty much forensic units, uh, and that trend has gone on since the Supreme Court rulings in the 80s and whatnot. So, is there any discussion, any case in the state to actually repurpose? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't you want to do the same facility given the nature of the the, the current population, but is do the state have any appetite at all for moving back into providing these services at state facilities? So I think there is uh, some discussion. I mean, the state facilities are um, in need of uh, revitalization. I think the state is looking at what are some of the alternatives, including a major you know, capital project. There's um, certainly the adult facility in Cambridge is modern, but uh, that's about the extent of the state hospitals. And I think uh, we're talking about um, a capital project of perhaps a, a billion dollars to, uh, to, to revitalize that. Uh, some of the ideas that have been bounced around include uh, repurposing of some of the excess capacity at community hospitals, uh, but um, that's not necessarily a an inexpensive enterprise uh, in itself, but it may be uh, less expensive than building uh, new state facilities. So the, um, there is a work group that has convened on uh, on planning for uh, for the next phase of uh, state facilities. That's looking at all, all these options. Uh, both Paul and I have talked to them, and I think they're looking at some possibilities in both avenues, um, construction and new facilities, as well as uh, leasing of existing space in uh, underutilized acute care hospitals. So this, um, in, in, in the urban areas, that seems to be a possibility. In the rural areas, uh, it's less, less, less so. I think our friends in Virgin now is probably interested <laughs> so, are there any more questions or comments? That will proceed to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations. Okay. And thank you, everyone from the University of Maryland team, for coming in um, and joining us today. Uh, as we move to the next item, just a point about uh, Peninsula. I really see that as almost a substitution project for the closure of the Adventist facility at Cambridge. They are, there's some distance from them, but we did see the closure. So Peninsula uh, coming in uh, is looked at over a period of a couple of years, probably on um, balance. Uh, we have not gained uh, all that much, but we're at least uh, treading water here. Agenda item number five relates to uh, certificate of ongoing performance for cardiac surgery services. We, we have two today. The first one is the University of Maryland Medical Center, uh, which I'll share, and then uh, Alec will come back and share that one. Uh, Maryland hospitals that provide cardiac surgery services are required to periodically recertify this specialized service to assure that their performance outcomes and quality assurance programs meet appropriate standards. Um, MHCC will now consider two ongoing performance reviews for cardiac surgery. Eileen Fleck, Chief of Acute Care Policy and Planning, and Jose Emesalu, I apologize if I uh, didn't say that correctly, a program manager in the Acute Care Policy and Planning Division will present the staff recommendations on the certificate. The first cardiac surgery program we will consider is that of the University of Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, 
October 4th, discussing in the Certificate of Ongoing Performance application of the University, University of Maryland Medical Center. I want to provide some background information on the development of Certificate of Ongoing Performance uh, process. The process is fairly new and it's unique to cardiac services. It provides a mechanism for ongoing oversight, including the possibility that the commission would shut a program down that's providing substandard care. But that would, of course, be preceded by doing a focus review and giving the hospital an opportunity to improve. So that process began um, basically with a law being passed in 2012 directing us to develop some regulations and convene a clinical advisory group that includes national and regional experts. And so we use that group to develop recommendations that could then be considered for incorporation into our regulations. Um, so our standards do reflect the recommendations of that group, as well as um, the recommendations from our standing cardiac services advisory committee and stakeholders as other stakeholders as part of the regulatory review process. Um, so if you have any questions about the development of the standards that we're using to review the the Maryland Cardiac Surgery Program, but I'd be happy to answer them now or after presenting the staff report. Okay, thanks. Um, so the University of Maryland Medical Center is meeting all the requirements for a certificate of ongoing performance. As shown on the next slide, um, the criteria primarily fall into four broad categories, data collection, quality, performance metrics, and volume. The hospital is participating in the required data collection by participating in the SPS Adult Cardiac Surgery Data Registry, and then also providing data requested by MSPC staff periodically. The hospital has explained that it conducts quality assurance for its cardiac surgery program through monthly meetings to look at cases with, with morbidity and mortality, having quarterly peer review meetings, and also multidisciplinary quality and performance improvement meetings. So the hospital provided meeting minutes from some of those meetings, and they also provided a letter submitted by the hospital's president attesting to the hospital's commitment to identifying areas for improvement in its cardiac surgery program. And based on that information, staff concluded that the hospital is meeting the general quality standards. With respect to the performance outcomes, the hospital is required to maintain an SPS composite score rating for cabbage cases that is two stars or higher. In the SPS composite star rating system, a program may be awarded one star, two star, three star, where, and a two star program is performing similar to the national average. A program with three stars is considered performing better than the national average at a statistically significant level, and a program with one star is considered performing significantly worse than the national average at a significant level statistically. So the composite score has four components. The operative mortality component is weighted approximately 80%. And then the other three components are the absence of major morbidity, the use of at least one internal mammary artery for the bypass graft, and use of four specific perioperative medications. As shown in Table 1 of the report, the hospital achieved two stars for each of six reporting periods shown. Each reporting period is 12 months, but the, the reporting periods overlap by six months. So um, consecutive reporting periods will have an overlap of six months. For each reporting period, less than half of the hospital's cardiac surgery volume was the isolated cabbage cases, which is not unexpected because it's an academic medical center, and so they do a lot of different types of cardiac surgery cases that probably are not done in community hospitals. Table two of the staff report provides information on another performance metric, the risk-adjusted all-cause operative mortality rate for isolated cabbage cases. The specific standard for the cabbage cases is not applicable um, because of changes that we made to the regulations and not being able to obtain the statewide average, which has been the previous benchmark. So we have presented information that is um, reflective of our current performance standard, which is using the national benchmark. And the hospital would be meeting the current standard if it had been applicable for each of those reporting periods. With respect to case volume, the hospital performed over 700 cases annually in fiscal years 2016, 2017, and 2018, which is well above the annual target volume of 200 cases. Staff has concluded that the hospital meets all of the requirements for a certificate of ongoing performance, and we recommend that the commission issue a certificate of ongoing performance for a four-year period that permits the hospital to continue providing cardiac surgery services. 
that concludes my presentation. I also want to mention that there are three representatives here for the hospital. Um, Dana Farrakhan, Senior Vice President for Strategy, Community, and Business Development. Tina Cafeo, Vice President for Cardiac Medicine, Surgical Nursing. And Christine Russell, Nurse Practitioner for Cardiac Surgery. You're welcome, and, and thank you, Eileen. Um, I guess we would have a motion. Okay. Uh, second. second. Uh, are there any questions? In that case, uh, all in favor? Okay. Any, uh, any opposed? Okay. There you have it. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we will bring back Commissioner Pollock for the second part too. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, City Commissioners. Um, I'll be presenting the certificate of ongoing performance report for Sinai Hospital of Baltimore. Um, the staff have found that Sinai Hospital of Baltimore, uh, which established its cardiac surgery program in 1990, it met all of the requirements for certificate of ongoing performance. Now, they were assessed based on the same um, review criteria used for University of Maryland, so um, I will not repeat that. Um, so, so for um, the success of data collection, China Hospital participates in the SDA adult cardiac surgery registry and other required, and also submit um, duplicate information to the Maryland Healthcare Commission as required. Um, for quality, um, the final hospital, um, there are three um, primary um, groups uh, at the hospital that engage in quality assurance, assurance programs. And these are the um, ongoing um, professional practice evaluation committee, the cardiovascular multidisciplinary committee, and also the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality report committee. Um, the hospital provided extensive documentation of all of these meetings, um, and this documentation includes the minutes and um, other um, and other materials that were used in the minutes uh, in the meeting. And they also um, provided information on evaluation of individual um, physicians. Um, with respect to specific performance indices. Um, additionally, the hospital also provided information on um, external peer review um, that was conducted by the hospital during the, throughout the review period. Um, the, the president of the hospital, Dr. Jonathan Ringo, um, who is the president and chief operating officer of the hospital, he submitted a letter stating that the hospital is committed to identifying and responding to um, quality assurance, quality assurance improvement areas. Um, with regard to the performance standards, the hospital um, had, it, had an STS score of two stars throughout the review program period, and um, as we see on, and, the, and this is, and they meet this standard because the requirement is two or three, two or more stars um, per year. Um, as you see on table two in the report, on table one of the report, about 72 to 85 percent of the hospital's cardiac surgery volume was isolated hazard, and this was the volume that went into computing the STS star rating. Um, in table two, um, you, one will observe the risk adjusted, uh, the all cost 30 days risk adjusted mortality. Um, and it was compared with the national average. And from um, the table, it will be observed that there was no statistically significant difference between um, China Hospital and the national average. Um, lastly, um, with regard to the um, volume requirements, um, China Hospital performed over 300 cardiac surgery cases per year um, throughout the review period, and um, this, uh, and this meets the um, minimum criteria of 200 cases per year. Um, staff concludes that final hospital met all of the requirements for the certificate of ongoing performance. Um, we recommend the commission authorize an issuance of certificate of ongoing performance for the hospital to continue providing cardiac surgery um, services for the next four years. Um, on the phone <coughs> today is um, the Ms. Jennifer Love. She is the director of Cardiovascular Institute uh, at China Hospital. Um, she couldn't make it in, but um, I believe she's on the phone. Yes, I am. Yeah. 
but to be on that. Okay, great. Well, in that case, do I have a motion? And second? All right, any questions or discussion? Go ahead, Commissioner O'Connor. Just a comment on the statistics. Seems like the mortality rate jumped almost tripled from Jan uh, calendar year 16 to fiscal year 17. It seemed to be a gradual increase in mortality rates. Is there any explanation for that? That is correct. Uh, so we did observe that and we had an internal discussion on that. And we reviewed all the quality um, quality uh, related materials they sent us with regard to the minutes, and there was really nothing that changed over time. Um, of, of course, if you notice, there was like a slight increase in the volume of, of patients that were seeing, but this cannot be attributed to that because the risk adjustment mortality rate is supposed to have been you know um, adjusted. Um, so we do not know why exactly that happened. Um, however, um, there was they were not you know the mortality was still within acceptable um, range because it was not statistically significantly different. And, and if you also notice with regard to, the, to that um, on, on page eight, on the table on page eight, um, the, last, the last couple of, um, you know, the last two charts for 2017 and 2018, uh, we did see that the mortality had increased to, you know, almost to the edge and, but you also notice that we did not use traditionally, um, you know, overlapping confidence intervals are used in, you know, trying to figure out if two measures um, are statistically significant or not. But with this, we use one confidence interval and a point estimate of the national. So that also, you know, so that it was also a, a more restricted um, 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 measure. And, you know, because we figured it, it was was still not statistically significantly different. We decided to present. Um, Thank you. So, any other questions, Mr. Bob? Yeah. The um, I, I noticed that the the volume thresholds aren't aren't close. They, they're meeting the, the volume thresholds very nicely. But when you look uh, the the, the calendar, fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 18, uh, there is a dramatic decrease. In the overall volume, 351 to 365, and 429 to 328 uh, in total cardiac surgery volume. Explain that dramatic uh, decrease. I think that could be corrected at the love who's on the phone in terms of the program. Sure. Are you still there on the phone? I am on the phone, yes. Were you able to hear the so question? Yes, I, it is very difficult, um, but I ha, I'm tracking with that. So uh, we had um, uh, a change in our surgeons, which often does, uh, we have two surgeons that are full time and uh, we had one that did um, uh, move on to Florida. So that corresponded with some change in terms of referrals. Um, those relationships are pretty tight and um, we have a, a new surgeon coming um, here next month, so I believe that um, we're going to be able to um, regain where we were because our cardiology um, community has remained fairly stable. Very good. Does the, the, does the change, in, it seems like those times change, does those times correspond to the change in the mortality rate as well? All right. Yeah. You know, certainly when you drop in your, the number of cases, and you're going to see more volatility in that sort of stuff. So it could easily be, and, and risk adjustment, although it's improved tremendously over the last couple of decades, that, that's still a pretty, you know, ho hopefully it's a rare event and, and hard to pick up and measure it accurately. So certainly a volume drop could, could certainly introduce a lot more volatility into the stuff you might. That's a very good point. Yep. Commissioner Grady, did you still have a question? No. Anyone else? In that case, all in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Melanie Cavalier, Chief of Innovative Care Delivery in the Center for Health Information Technology and Innovative Care Delivery, will propose one additional nomination to the Maryland Primary Care Advisory Council. As a reminder, as you heard earlier, uh, uh, the Commission approved staff's MDPCP Advisory Council nominations at the April 18th Commission meeting. Commissioners asked staff to add a nurse practitioner to the council. In the past month, staff received several recommendations. Ms. Cavalier, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, so I'm going to be um, relatively brief since um, uh, Commissioner Boyle already brought, brought this up and you've already gone through the main points. Um, there are just some reminders in the slide deck if anybody um, was not here for the meeting or um, uh, would like to be reminded. Uh, so we did defer the nomination to the Medicare beneficiary, as was mentioned earlier, and then um, people were asked, uh, we were asked to bring a nurse practitioner um, nomination forward. We went through the overview of the um, program of the council and the um, purpose of the council, which is to provide uh, key input from key stakeholders. So we went over the role and the responsibilities. So the nomination that we're going to bring today is Kathy Chapman, who is a nurse practitioner and a nurse. She has a practice located in LaVale, Maryland. So this is her biography, which shows her extensive experience as a nurse and a nurse practitioner. And at this time, staff would recommend to approve the nomination. Um, does anyone have questions on anything presented in the project? I have a motion. Second. Discussion, questions? Yes. How did you come to us? Or some Commissioner Hammerfall. So just uh, a little clarity on this. That, uh, we did receive three or four uh, recommendations from uh, and, and people who self who volunteered. Uh, Ms. Chapman is a um, operates a nurse practitioner practice, which is kind of rare. She's also uh, in the program, and she's also uh, operates in Western Maryland which uh, we didn't have a lot of representation. Uh, Commissioner O'Grady's observation, you know, uh, try to find someone that is really uh, solely aligned with in a discipline was something we kept uh, in mind, as well as uh, uh, Commissioner Hammerslaw's recommendation. We thought of the uh, several we had, this was the strongest. And certainly, you don't find a whole lot of nurse practitioners successfully operating by themselves. So I think she'd have a perspective that would not be present otherwise on the council. Very good. Uh, here, seeing no other discussion, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, Nikki. Mr. Majewski, Division Chief, Health Information Technology, will provide an overview of the Advisory Committee's recommendations in the Health Record and Payment Integration Program Advisory Committee Final Report. The Advisory Committee was convened by staff to assess the feasibility of creating a Health Record and Payment Integration Program. Ms. Majewski, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. So my presentation today will focus mainly on recommendations proposed by the Health Record and Payment Integration Advisory Committee. These recommendations were included in the draft report and the 12 well slides in your meeting materials. Just some um, context about why the recommendations were developed. Uh, legislation passed in 2018 required staff to convene an advisory committee to assess the feasibility of creating a health record and payment integration program. Um, with a focus in five specific areas, which will be noted shortly. In terms of the approach, the advisory committee consisted of 43 stakeholder members representing various stakeholder groups. All meetings were open to the public and working papers posted on the MHPC website. The meetings were facilitated using more of a roundtable discussion approach, uh, where stakeholders commented on a wide range of policy and technology issues. Uh, feedback was used by a draft recommendations uh, subcommittee to develop draft recommendations. Uh, that was open to all members of the full committee and the public. And then those draft recommendations brought back to the full committee for review and discussion. So 
as for the findings and recommendations, the advisory committee recommends establishing a task force to conduct a more in-depth assessment of making claims data available through CRISP as well as evaluate other alternatives such as improving accuracy and availability of clinical data already available. Uh, this recommendation builds on work from about two years ago when Chris demonstrated some success in a small proof of concept pilot um, in regards to the technical integration of claims data. Um, however, there was a number of policy related issues that were identified that would need to be addressed to scale implementation. Um, and so for that reason, it was decided that a specific task group could kind of evaluate some of those strengths and deficits related to some of these legal, economic, and um, resource-related um, matters. As for the remaining four study requirements noted on slide six, seven, eight, and nine, the commission, or the advisory committee, uh, determined that no action was recommended at this time, um, and that's as it relates to establishing a free and secure web-based portal, incorporating PDMP data into CRISP as this data is already made available, accelerating the adjudication of clean claims, and then lastly for other matters of interest identified pertaining to a unique patient identifier and smart card technology. This summary slide here includes a few overarching staff observations which are somewhat the basis of the proposed recommendations. So I'll pause here for a moment and give you an opportunity to review and then before we move on to commission action on the report. We comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Boyle. I, I'm, yeah, my concern much is much more the interoperability within uh, the state of Maryland, particularly uh, primary care practices and you know, other practices with hospitals, so the patient uh, can get the best care possible and coordinate uh, all of their care. Um, is that part of what they're trying to look into? So that was one of the key. Um, uh, Things starting to discuss, and in addition to HIPAA and high tech um, changes that are coming along the, down the pipe with in terms of TESA and trying to um, increase interoperability through um, a network of networks um, and enabling more information to flow with the patient across the care continuum, which was the reason for deciding no action and sort of just letting the existing efforts continue. Um, and not sort of add on to this existing infrastructure where there's so much activity going on to address some of those barriers. Maybe you could uh, use a couple terms that everyone may not be familiar with. Maybe you can elaborate on, on those. Uh, go back to uh, do a rewind and define the terms that you mentioned, especially uh, uh, the newest sort of latest iteration ONC, uh, the Office of National Coordinators, IPS. Sure. Um, that's, you know. Absolutely. So uh, this relates to TESCA. So there's sort of these two components, this discussed exchange framework, and then this common agreement. And these principles would sort of help sort of be the rules of the road that help provide this single on-ramp to, um, to connectivity and enabling interoperability. And they're doing this through promotion of using APIs. And then Again, again, what's an API? Oh, an application your... programming interface. So I apologize. <laughs> so yeah, so this has been basically the bridge that kind of the secure bridge that connects one system to another system to, to exchange data securely. Um, <laughs> but around all of this, these this is the um, this the TEFTA aims to scale. Uh, implementation of connectivity and, and, and interoperability nationwide. Um, now that the, the existing, the core infrastructure um, exists as it relates to EHRs and health information security. But just at the, at the ground floor level, if I understand this correctly, the interoperability question is that this connects to CRISP, which is 
already interoperable to the, to the primary care. So provider. this is this was asking us to potentially create a new program. Right. One element of the program was the PDMP data, which already does exist through CRIS. PDMP, the prescription PDMP. drug monitoring plan. Yes. So this is the controlled dangerous substances. I'm really not doing a good job at this. <laughs> yeah. So um, the requirement in statute two for for pharmacies to report controlled dangerous substances and then that information to be queried by providers already exists. The other component in in the law around integrating claims to Chris, um, like you said, there was a small pilot, but more work is needed there. And then the other piece around um, establishing a web-based portal, um, most of these already exist from payers as well as some EHR vendors and sort of this existing investment in electronic health record technology, sort of the concern around who, who would embrace sort of this place and potentially keep their existing system. What about the ability of patients, particularly patients with chronic uh, complex conditions, to access all of their data into one place? You know, for instance, some organizations and some individuals have an electronic personal health record and they just want to bring everything in and at one time blue button technology is going to do that and then that went by the board. Um, is this something we're looking at that not only the providers get it but the patients can get their hands on everything and have a complete look at you know what's really happening to them? So, uh, just step in. That's a great question, and that is the, the end goal. Um, Ten years ago, when actually 2011, my math is bad today, when high tech was first proposed, uh, that was perceived as an achievable goal right away. And you had a lot of organizations, even technology startups, the big guys, Google, Yahoo, um, they developed these PHRs, these personal health records. It, it didn't, it didn't, they weren't enamored by the public. And they were missing. They were fledgling ideas that eventually fell off the map. Nikki mentioned this trusted exchange framework, this common agreement that's being proposed by the Office of the National Coordinator. This is actually version two. They put it out there uh, more than a year ago and received so many comments. They tweaked it and come back out again. It includes an element of having um, <coughs> the ability of consumers, the requirement on providers even payers now, which is very different than what previously existed, that consumers would have an ability to get their information um, through these different entities. What is missing a bit is the coordination among those entities. So if you go to an insurance company, you would be able to get your, your health information that they have, but the, your provider may have some of that as well. So it's a patch quilt work, but it's a progression. Um, HIEs are not yet there where they have these good consumer-facing engines, um, the ability for consumers to log in and get that data. They do make that some of that information available, but it's not perfect yet. So if we roll the tape ahead five more years, the question you have, I don't think it exists right now. So just educate me for a second. So the mother of HIEs is CRISP, or how does that work? That's a very interesting way to, to phrase them. And all these other entities, theoretically, will eventually be no. connected to Chris? No. no. Actually, what you have is an evolution when, back to high tech, when it was introduced, so that there was no brick and mortars infrastructure. There was not an entity in the middle. If you're, as a physician, you're familiar with claims clearing houses. They were established to move electronic data from systems that couldn't talk to one another. And so that same concept was created by ONC. It's build this infrastructure, throw all this money into the, to the nation, and you had probably 68 to 70 different health information exchanges that popped up, all brick and mortars. But as technology has evolved, and your EHR vendors, your Epics, your Cerners, your others that exist today, they've started to solve the challenges that these infrastructures in the middle were conceived of to do. And at, so the infrastructures in the middle are evolving. When you think of Chris, the services they provide are broad range. They do a lot of support services on data analysis and aggregation of information. They also will serve as that man in the middle when you still don't have all these EHRs, hundreds of them, that are able to communicate well with one another. 
10 years from now, as we know in HIV today, if it hangs on to we just want to be the guy handing the, the medical information, they won't exist. And that seems abundantly apparent. But um, CRISP is one of eight HIV health information exchanges in Maryland that are registered based upon the commission's requirements on registration um, that exist as a result of statute. Uh, though there are others that the definition changed in law back in the AP session that went into effect in October. So there'll be more HIEs that consume largely the CHR vendors, Cerner, Epic, um, uh, these other large information systems vendor, Greenway. So they'll be coming into the fold too. Thank you. Can I ask a follow up on that? Um, so you said, but in 10 years, I guess right now the way to, to your, your point, yeah, and I do, you know, I look up my claims from my insurer's website. I look up my labs from, you know, whoever, LabCorp. I look, uh, you know, I, I look on my CVS and they tell me about my scripts. But is it a tech, the technology is not there to integrate it or there's no business case? So the, it's the five years. Am I going to pay $500 to have someone else put them all together for me? Probably I'm just going to go to five or six different websites. These, and these are great questions because it's more, it, it, I would project, and this is a matter of opinion more than is um, empirical evidence, that the, the brick and mortars of the health information exchanges, as is in 10 years, if they don't evolve, won't probably exist. On the CHR side of the equation, it is a, more of a five-year journey um, because the rules that are being proposed by the Office of the Mass Coordinator are forcing providers and payers to publish data when in the past it wasn't so readily there. In fact, as you know, a lot of competition occurs because of data ownership. And um, these, new, these new requirements are uh, fostering that engagement. Um, we will see vendors pop up that say, hey, look, we can, if you, the consumer, give us permission, we can aggregate all your medical records together. It's a great business model. Um, likewise, there will be folks like, to your point, that will just reach out to CVS and reach out to your doctor and reach out to your payers and, and, and gather information through um, what Nikki mentioned would be a portal-based application. Mm -hmm. yeah. Commissioner Gordon. Um, as a new new kid on the block, I guess, I just wanted to make sure I understand, and then, Nikki, maybe you and Dave can answer. <clears throat> We're sitting here doing this because the Senate passed a bill, and they sent it to us and said, explore this. And I can't imagine how much time and energy, uh, having read this over a year, whatever, you put into to coming up. And unfortunately, if I, if I read this, there's not a lot of recommendation, I, and I, I mean, really, that anybody can do anything with. And um, I don't disagree um, with any of the findings or anything, but I'm just curious, what do you think, and, and maybe it's not an appropriate subject, but what are the ramifications when, after a study, we come back with this, uh, which is appropriate? Is the Senate going to turn around and... I mean, does, does this officially get presented to somebody, and then we have to go, we have to go justify why we said this? Uh, is it a vicious cycle? Then they pass another bill, or I'm I'm just curious why we're doing this and how it works. So something yeah, very I'll, short, though. Yeah. I don't want to take people's time. Yeah, everybody so, else knows this, but so this was um, a bill that had been. Um, the child of, of a physician uh, in Howard County that pushed this repeatedly over a number of years. Uh, I think the same ideas that he had in 2014 got into the 2018 bill. And um, I think it might be safe to say that the legislature relented. Uh, they thought there were some ideas that were good, but you know, clearly even at passage, the idea of a, uh, a a card was something whose time had passed. So um, in some instances, I think the question you're asking is very pointed and right. I think the expectation is we would look at this and leverage it into other things we're doing. We have uh, one more study, I think, that's more timely that focuses on 
the expansion of the non-controlled uh, dangerous substance data uh, and making that available would be uh, a recommendation they would be looking for us to make. But I don't think that too many people will be surprised that we said not a lot here. And if I might add on to our executive director's comment, uh, Commissioner Gordon, uh, your question is, is extremely important to know, in one where it's important to know that um, what we have found with stakeholder work groups in the many years we've, had, we've been asked to convene them is that there's an evolution or a growth of education that occurs when you bring various stakeholders together that level sets per perspective, that level sets expectation. It takes ideas, particularly innovative ones like this one, where out of the box, you might say, well, let's just go do it. It brings everyone together to mature in terms of an outcome that everyone is, seems to be comfortable with, and it settles the, the question or the issues related to what's being studied. studied. And that's a lot of what happened in these work sessions. Was Dr. Together. Taylor, who, who was you know, the apostle for this, uh, concurs with the recommendation. Okay. So uh, I think he changed his perspective uh, as others, uh, including uh, David and his team said, maybe this is not the, in some instances, the time has passed. In other instances, we're not there yet. So, uh, you just need a motion on that. That's one question because when I originally read the recommendation to the study, it, there's two directions to obtain this, and I completely would concur on the recommendation that there's a claim system being built. But if we're used to follow the original question, we're also collecting money and putting it back seems to be within the original scope. And I'm assuming that th that raises a whole host of new questions about transferring money. Is that, is that just been completely off the table? Uh, so the work group um, considered that issue and moved in a, a different direction as it relates to the use of portals. Right. I mean, you become a financial fiduciary in a way yeah. that you are not now. A motion to uh, approve the report. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Melanie, you're back up. Melanie Cavalier, Chief of Innovative Care Delivery in the Center for Health Information Technology and Innovative Care Delivery, will present on the CMS Primary Cares Initiative. Primary Cares Initiative, which is a new set of care delivery and payment models intended to transform primary care to deliver better value for patients throughout the healthcare system. The models were released by CMS on April 22nd. Ms. Cavalier, please proceed. Thank you. Hello again. Um, so I'm going to um, go through this. There's a lot of information in these slides. So I'm just going to present some of the highlights, and please feel free to ask um, any questions either um, as we go through it or at the end. So um, as, uh, Ms. as the chair mentioned uh, last month, there were five new payment model options that were released. Um, they're under two tracks, primary care first and direct contracting. And both models are a five-year demonstration meant to test whether the delivery of advanced primary care can reduce the total cost of care. So the five new payment models are designed with providers, uh, for providers with advanced primary care capabilities that are prepared to accept increased financial risk in exchange for flexibility and potential rewards based on practice performance. So um, this slide is going to show um, kind of an overview of the um, primary care first. So similar to CPC Plus and the MDPCP, which are two uh, federal programs, one is specific to Maryland, and the other is um, in um, several regions, 18 regions across the United States, um, which are a, a test of primary care. Um, and the two um, primary care first models are oriented around the five primary care functions, which are shown on here on the left side. So access to continuity, care management, and those bullets. Under both models, practices must meet quality care standards to be eligible for performance-based adjustments. And on the right side, there are the measures that are used to calculate the performance-based bonus. So there are three payment streams under this. Um, there's a flat visit payment for face-to-face -face encounters. There's a prospective total monthly payment based on average patient risk score grouping. And there's a performance-based adjustment that has both upside and downside risk. 
and this slide shows the numbers of those payments if anybody has questions on email. So the next slide shows the key elements for the model options. I'd like to call your attention to item number two, which refers to the 26 selected regions listed in the appendix. The regions consist of the 18 CPC Plus regions and eight additional regions, which include California and Florida. So you'll notice Maryland is not actually a region, um, but Maryland does have the ability to offer a similar plan under our total cost of care arrangement with CMS. So the second um, PFC payment is specifically designed for patients with serious illnesses. Practice may limit their participation to SIP patients, and SIP patients who cur currently don't go to a practice in the model will be assigned to a model participant. The payment for SIP patients will reflect the high need, high risk nature of this population. These payments include a quality-based um, payment adjustment. And hospice or palliative care service providers are able to participate either as a practice or by partnering with a practice. This shows the timeline. CMS um, anticipates re, uh, releasing a request for application in the spring, and uh, those participants selected would start in January of 2020. And then they anticipate doing another round of applications in 2020 for participation in January of 2021. I'm now going to go through the direct contracting models. So these are three models designed to create a competitive delivery system environment where organizations offering greater efficiencies and better quality of care will be um, rewarded. So depending on the model chosen, the model participant will receive a fixed monthly payment that can range from a portion of the anticipated primary care cost to the total cost of care. And the quality measures for the new model focus more on outcomes and beneficiary experience than on um, process relative to existing CMS initiatives. So this slide shows the professional option. It offers the lowest risk sharing arrangement, which is 50% of savings or losses on the total cost of care. And they can also get, they get a primary care capitation, which is equal to 7% of, of uh, primary, of, I'm sorry, total cost of care. The next slide shows the global option which um, participants bear 100% of the risk of shared savings losses on total cost of care for aligned beneficiaries, and they can choose between two payment options, primary care capitation, which I previously mentioned, or total care capitation. Uh, the next one is a geographic, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the next one's a geographic option, which um, is for um, all of the patients alive, aligned in a target region. Um, it's also 100% of savings and losses, and for this model, CMS is, um, is seeking a request for information uh, to refine the design parameter. So this concludes my presentation. Uh, CMS has indicated that they will release more guidance on these models in the upcoming months, and at this time, I'm happy to open it up for discussion or comments. Commissioner Grady. Help us understand a little bit the CMS logic here. So um, in terms of, so we've got kind of two programs, I take it, the primary care first and then the direct contract. So is, is it a different set of, like direct contracting strikes me when you went through it, you could be an insurer, you could be an MA plan, you could be someone like that, versus primary care first, at least on, on first blush, appeared to be simply individual or groups of, of physicians for the most part. Is that, am I conceptualizing this properly? So you're trying to you're trying to capitate and move downstream, and so they're offering these different kinds of options that is now part of MA plans and whatever else you might think about these lines. So is that what's going on here? It's a different target audience between the two programs. So so I believe that's right based on the information that we have right now. Then okay. it seems like that must be the case. Okay, and I guess as I thought, I was focusing candidly more on the on the uh, direct contracting aspects of it, um, and I and so. The difference between global and professional is so, the amount of risk you carry. So um, global at life. Uh, there's also the the amount of risk is 50 percent, and it's also um, the capitation is only for the primary care capitation. Okay. I'm sorry, that's for the professional. For the global, it's 100 percent, and then you, it's for a set of aligned beneficiaries. And you can get the primary care capitation or the total care. Capitation. And how is that different than what we think of as ACOs do now? Is that a population? So presumably, some people, the patient has 
some choice. I believe it's not different. Than oh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Point is good one. The, the concept that CMS has, has really built us around is, as you noted, is one is on the professional side, and, and the other is more on the, the side of the equation where there have been ACOs or Medicare Advantage plans, where the direct contracting enables a different payment model, but still represents a bit of that fee for service type environment for the beneficiary. Okay, so behind it, it doesn't it doesn't look like managed care. But in effect, it, I would say the answer to that is it, it, has a, it does have a bit of a look and walk, but as direct contract entities are responsible for all the participants that are in the care delivery stream, it's the provider, participating providers, and it's the other entities that may be providing care to that so individual. Who do we think would be interested in this? Is this I mean, the geographic I kind of saw, that sounded like MA plan for rural. You know, I'm Geisinger in the middle of Pennsylvania, and I already kind of have arrangements with 90% of the providers, hospitals, and docs in that area. But I'm not really an MA plan. I'm not organized like an HMO. It is so. In, in no. is this meant to so pick I, up these people? Who I, I, I think that you also have to think about this. So the the first the primary care first program is really an add-on to the regions that have the CPP plus program today. Yes. This program I think is conceived of as going to work everywhere and is ACO version two uh, in many ways. Uh, and you know, they're a little bit indeterminate on who they think might apply for it. What's really if anyone? Yeah. If, if it and the geographic uh, PBP looks and smells a lot like the Maryland model, except it's not hospital-led. It seems to me to be saying we're going to unfold the total cost of care geographic model um, and let, as you observe, potentially payers, potentially a hospital, potentially a, um, a large physician practice come to us with ideas here. In fact, they're at the stage where this is Still, you know, an RFI. Okay. Tell us about this. So I think we wanted to just sort of clearly give signals that are moving away from existing models and coming up with your know, quote. And does it have a total cost of care component? Is yeah. it talking both Medicare and Medicaid money? More than a total cost. I'm just going to talk to duels. I'm going to cover Central Pennsylvania. Yeah, it is. And total I'm going to, you know, whatever whoever your insurer is. It's it's not clear to me that that for that for a for the geographic model, how they would built in other Medicaid um, it's been, you know, for dual. Uh, perhaps that's one of the big challenges with the existing models, how do dual fit in, into those models. Well, that seems even more doable, though, because you see I have this subpopulation that is dual, and, I, and we work out some agreements about incentives and payments and whatnot, and we move forward. If you tell me I have to cover a geographic area, I'm responsible for the Medicare population in that area, the Medicaid population, most of who are not going to be dual, but I have to coordinate kind of the total cost of care in these 10 counties or whatever, plus the, plus the commercial? Well, I would, throw in the 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 com I would not bring in the commercial. No, no, okay, okay, we'll leave that out for now. I think I, yeah, I, I'm just, um, so are we setting up kind of a, an MA plan that does both Medicare and Medicaid? Part of the reason that there's, there's an RFI that's going to be released because I don't think these answers have been resolved okay. completely. And the other point to note, even when it does get to the application, your, your question about who would apply, um, CMS wants applications or letters of intent before they determine who actually gets selected, and only those who submit a letter of intent would be considered um, as an eligible candidate. So are we in a, in a kind of a, a standoff here? Why would I, I mean, our, our industry representatives can speak to this. Why would you ever, Submit a letter of intent before you kind of knew what the rules of payment in the game. They were. they will they'll do the RFI first, then followed by they'll publish release more information, more guidance, okay. and then they would do the letter of intent. Okay, so so you know what you're getting into. Yeah. And this seems a little bit of a yeah. It is it is a sequential process. What we don't have are specific dates around how that will occur. Um, CMS hasn't released dates for expectations. Okay. And do we get a feel that they're committed to this? Um, certainly the way they 
presented it, it seems a little bit the last administration's game plan. They presented it with a lot of passion. Okay. Okay. It's got a new name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we have Medicare Advantage. I mean, to a certain degree, I'm going, what, 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 you know, I was missing this. Is, I thought it was not really value based payment the market. to the primary care. Not here. So, there's two equations that, that Melanie pointed out. There's the, there's the um, professional side of the equation, um, primary care first, the two payment models there, and then there are the three payment models and the direct contract. So, okay. Nice. Okay. So, so, one of the questions I had about development. Value-based payment model for the providers is it's 125 Medicare beneficiaries. There's no way to have statistical credibility to anybody's outcome, right? I mean, on the study or on the evaluation point. Yeah, right. So uh, it's not. Well, the key feature of the ACOs, the key feature of our PCMH program, is that we aggregate enough lives together to right. feel like you are reducing the overall cost of care or not, not just rolling the dice on the individual patient who may or may not get better yeah. for reasons independent of. Right. This is, I know they didn't teach this in law school, but this is what we call law of large numbers. But they don't seem to have that here. They for don't have providers. It. So, so that means that some providers are going to take a bath and some providers are going to get a windfall. Well, I, I think that's a that's an interesting point, and that happened that happened under CPC, that happened in CPC yeah. Plus, that happened wherever you have these shared risk arrangements. The evaluators tend to focus on, to Commissioner Sarge's point, is to the math. But in Medicare, in our past experience with MA plans, when they were called something else, it meant that MA plans went in where they could make extremely good margins and just pulled out or never went into the markets where they couldn't. So you had an access problem where they got the formula wrong in the negative direction, and you had an overspend problem in where they got it, you know, like Miami-Dade County, those kind of places. Thank, Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I just had... One, one last question. One last question. What are the safeguards for the patients in some of these programs? It's, it's all about um, uh, reducing costs and you know, giving more quality, which is good. But wouldn't there be an incentive in some cases to um, uh, deny uh, certain procedures? But, yeah. Do you want, Melanie, you want to so, yeah, so the, um, if you'll notice on the measures page, the first one is patient experience of care. So they definitely, the difference, I mean, I was certainly around when they rolled out HMO, so I do remember what happened through all that. But um, the, the big difference now is the quality um, that they're looking at um, as they measure that going on and patient experience to ensure that they're not impacting that negatively. That, that, it's a good point, but we, what, what's missing in here is the mortality measure from outcome. And uh, patients who died don't have an opportunity to share their poor experience. Uh, and I would agree on that. We, we do understand that, that the efforts to decrease readmissions in conditions like CHF and decrease admissions in CHF have been associated with increases in mortality before. So there's evidence to suggest that that's true. Uh, and to see this again rolling out without those appropriate measures attached to it reminded me of the same thing. This is the last administration's agenda. I'm a little surprised to see it. We'll see where it goes next. More to hear. More to come from CMS. That's actually what appears to be occurring. Ben, would you like to share the upcoming activities for June's public meeting? So uh, we do have, uh, I think we're going to take a hiatus from CON, but we will have uh, uh, very likely a uh, a reg to consider that has uh, been on the agenda before. That's uh, 10, 24, 20, uh, the nursing home regs. As you may recall, we uh, presented those. Um, it developed uh, quite an outcry from the industry. We made one modification and have repromulgated those. Uh, we will, we have gotten comments again, uh, and we will uh, share those with you and you'll consider whether you vote to take those finals. We will also uh, be presenting uh, a designation agreement with CRISP, uh, like the Patient Safety Center of the Healthcare Commission does redesignate uh, uh, the Health Information Exchange. There is no uh, meaningful alternative to CRISP. 
but we have been working uh, on this latest agreement to, um, I think, clarify the areas in which CRISP works as a health information exchange and where it works as a private enterprise and therefore um, does not have the banner of the health information exchange as the um, shillelagh for uh, getting state contracts. Uh, we think that there is value for competition, but there's also a need to continue to stand up the exchange, but uh, simply crying out that they are the exchange uh, should not be the uh, imprimatur for some, you know, being awarded uh, state funding in all, on, in all fronts. Um, Ken will present the help, uh, the private uh, spending, they're spending for the, by the privately insured. Um, that has some meaning uh, to the uh, health benefit exchange as well as to the payers in terms of trends and spending uh, going forward. And Nathan will have a more uh, meaningful update on what we plan to do with all the statutory changes uh, that were en enacted and signed by the governor most recently, including plans for several of the studies. So uh, we had planned that this meeting would be over at 2.30, uh, but uh, didn't get started as quickly. So uh, please uh, bear with us, but uh, we hope to have a hold these meetings to two hours if we can. That said, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Thank you.